Welcome, Dr. Ferreira Gonzalez. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This is very exciting. Oh, for me too. So as a pediatrician, this is my bread and butter, you know, feeding concerns. And so I'm really, really excited to have you here because I know that I am going to learn a lot. My fellow pediatricians are going to learn a lot. And I think this will be very valuable for so many parents because there's so much we can do to fix problems early or even to prevent them. So I want to start with just the earliest time that this a feeding issue comes up, which is after the baby's born, right? I mean, I now all hospitals have to be, um, I think they call it baby friendly, um, but it's really pro breastfeeding and anti bottle feeding. Um, and I know that that we're on the same page that fed is best. So let's start with this scenario of here's a brand new mom and her baby and she's trying to breastfeed and she's struggling. Yeah, absolutely. So um, baby friendly is exactly, as you said, it is geared towards getting every baby a breast and giving every mom the opportunity to breastfeed. And we know the outcomes for both the baby and the mom and the bonding are exceptional when that happens in a perfect world. But sometimes a parent might choose not to. And if they choose not to, for whatever reasons they are, we don't want parents to feel shamed or guilty about that, right? So we want to make sure that we're empowering parents to follow their course and listen to their heart and research is research, but we have to also be cognizant and aware and compassionate to other people's decisions. I also like to say is that when a parent, a mom especially, has it in her heart, she really, 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 really wants to breastfeed and it is not going well, we also have to make sure that we're super supportive for that and, and make sure that we're emotionally tackling that and not furthering that mom's feeling of shame and guilt. Because I see a lot of parents saying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm doing everything. Baby's not gaining weight. You know, they're dehydrated. They're cranky. They're crying. They're not sleeping. And what I see is these moms starting to spiral and it's bad mm -hmm. enough that they're already, you know, um, postpartum They're not that they're having depression, but hormones are going crazy. They have a new little being that they're in charge of. And if they have other children, it's a lot. Um, so first and foremost, I, I'm a big just advocate for being compassionate and making sure that we're supporting those fam families. But when it comes down to the nitty gritties of it, if a parent can't breastfeed and she's met with a lactation consultant, uh, we really can't underscore the importance of a lactation consultant there. Mm -hmm. Wealth and knowledge is just through the roof. Um, and so we definitely want to support um, some kind of uh, consultation with that. And if that mom has come to the decision that it's not going to work and we have to transition to a bottle or we have to supplement with the bottle, uh, there are so many great things that we can do. Years ago, there was that whole concept of nipple confusion where the um, lactation consultants didn't want uh, breastfed babies to have a pacifier or to try any bottle because it creates this nipple confusion. We have now debunked that. Oh, good. Part. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually flow rate confusion. It all comes down to the flow rate. And so we have babies that fall into one of two conditions. You see a breast, for a baby to feed from a breast, they have a lot more control over what comes out of that mommy breast with every suck, with every compression, with all of that uh, synergistic movement that a baby can do. It's not the same with the bottle. It's definitely not the same with a standard silicone nipple, rubber nipple. So we either see that the mom's breast flow rate is slow and the baby can control it. And that's very comforting for the baby. So then when a mom goes to try a bottle and that flow rate is fast, baby can't control it. And it's very exhausting for that baby to try to figure out how to swallow and breathe and suck without this liquid drowning them. So we then have nipple confusion or flow rate confusion. And then we have babies on the other spectrum. We have these babies that when you are breastfeeding, you have more control because you're using more of your muscles. And then we have the subset of babies though that are like, oh, I don't wanna use my muscles. I rather be lazy and just have liquid pour into my mouth. And so these are the babies that sometimes prefer a bottle over a mommy breast. It's easier to satisfy on a breast if you don't mind liquid flowing into your mouth at a very, very fast rate. Wait, I'm going to interrupt for just a minute, though, because I want to go back about those babies. Some, first of all, some of those babies um, are weaker. They may have low muscle tone. They may be premature. So it's not even a matter of they're, they're lazy. I don't want <laughs> Yes, yes. I was, I was, I'm thinking only full-term babies, but right. yes, if there's those right. subsets, right. for sure. Yeah, especially but even the full-term babies that are smaller or lower tone, 
And I want to I want to not forget to talk about tongue tie because it sounds like we're going to get past it. And I, I I promised my listeners already. I've already had interviewed an ENT. I've interviewed a lactation consultant for people who are listening to this saying she's not talking enough about breastfeeding. I interviewed a lactation consultant, Dr. Laura Macaluso, um, and I talked about tongue tie with all of them. And I said I'm going to speak to a speech therapist too. So I need to address tongue tie because a lot of parents will say, okay, the breastfeeding isn't working. It must be somebody told me it's a tongue tie. Okay, that's a great point. And thank you for keeping me on track because I could just talk and talk. Uh, when it comes to the tongue tie in our little babies, uh, what we now know, there's some really very interesting research coming out of New Zealand by Dr. Nikki Mills. She's a um, otolaryngologist there. Uh, she's published extensively. She actually did a cadaver study on adults. It was adult cadavers, but she was trying to figure out the makeup of a uh, frenulum. Uh, there was always this concept of it's a band and then well, was it, is it an anterior band? Does it go all the way posterior? What's the, what's the nature, the anatomy of this? And what she found out was that it's actually part of the myofascia system. So the uh, myofascia system runs through all of our body. It connects every piece of us together through a series of these very gelatinous webs. And um, they communicate with each other. This is where like um, radiating pain comes from. And, you know, you sleep funny and then like you have like this pain in your shoulder. Like you didn't even sleep on that shoulder. Why does the shoulder hurt? It's part of your myofascia system. Mm. So there's some very um, interesting new therapies coming out to treat a tongue tie without a phrenectomy. So uh, we know things like myofascia release, trigger point releases, uh, cranial sacral therapies. All of these work on the myofascia system. So the idea is, this web of gelatinous spindles all over our body that are connected. If an area gets knotted up, it's going to pull on these other areas. So if we could release in particular, like our trapezius, these muscles back here, we often see a very quick release in the tightness of the frenulum. Um, and it's amazing. You could literally, I'm, I'm trained in neonatal massage and I can hit these, tri these trigger points for these babies. Wow. And literally all of a sudden they have necks. Like we have some of these babies that their shoulders are up by their ears and this is just how they stay, right? They're so used to like this little tight extension and you give this therapy and all of a sudden they have necks and we see a lot more movement in their tongue when they have that release. So um, it's definitely something that parents should be aware of and physicians to be aware of. It doesn't always have to go right to a, um, to a surgical procedure. Amazing. I wonder if that also has something to do with torticollis, because I'm thinking about the babies being kind of squished in utero and the head tilted yeah. to the side. It sounds like that would be good for that oh, too. Oh, myofascia. That is 100%. Yeah. So there's a lot of, um, you know, I'm very big on preventative. There's a lot of preventative things that you can do, even just recommending your parents at night after their showers to put the babies on on and prone on their bellies and massage them, mm. literally massage their back. This is going to release all of that. You don't yeah. have to know, you don't have to know where the trigger points are. Just that alone, it's going to be bonding for mom and baby and dad a baby, caregiver and baby, whoever it is. Um, it's going to really help that myofascia system up in this shoulder girdle and will help with the friend the frenulum as well. That is such an amazing simple tip. Just massage your baby can help. Maybe. And I mean, I'm more than happy to give you like more specific techniques if that's something you're interested in, but um, it's not rocket science. It's you make your baby feel good and you listen wow. to your baby. If your baby flinches, that means they don't like it. And so you stop doing that. So it's very intuitive to your baby and it's uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful way to bond as well. That is such an awesome, simple technique. I love that. Yeah. I to remember that. Okay. So Back for just a minute to the tongue tie. I do want to say that I spoke to a dentist who was concerned about the people who were um, releasing the upper lip tie that she said that actually can um, remove the space needed for teeth later. And um, the ENT was concerned about low muscle tone babies who get a tongue tie because the tongue is more likely to fall back. So it makes sense with the idea that sometimes less is more. So just food for thought for people who are, you know, looking for the, the, the magic answer to feeding issues, which would be, you know, in their mind, release of the tongue tie. But what else could we do besides release tongue ties? What else could be a problem and what else could we do? Right. So um, we do know that there are different feeding positions that also help uh, when it comes to breastfeeding. We want to make sure that that infant has, um, a position that is extra supportive to their head and their neck. Um, sometimes 
when we leave them to have just support on us, like we, we train parents when they breastfeed to lean back and let the baby be on them. This is very supportive, but I, in that instance, do encourage parents to make sure that they still give that baby a lot of head and neck support and back mm -hmm. support, because if it is um, not structural as much as it is physiologic with that myofascial system, we know that more stability creates more mobility. So that whole idea of stability is great. If you have a baby that's on the bottle, we know the same holds true. So think about these babies, they're in the womb, they're used to this tight, compact, boundaried area that gives them a lot of support. So we often see a lot of people learning in the hospitals in their um, maternity say to leave the baby unswaddled during mm -hmm. the feeding, right? So they'll wake up, right? So they'll wake up, we don't want, the truth is they need that stability for good mobility. So we are big proponents for keeping babies swaddled through a feeding because if you ever like sat on a bar stool without a foot rung, you feel a little right. up there, you're less likely to go and reach for your coffee cup. Same thing with the baby. Without that good support to their system, they're not going to be as likely to move their extremities, their tongue and their jaw, their extremities in that case. So what we promote is containment. So that's going to be the swaddle. Alignment. We want their body to be symmetrical and align alignment, containment, and... I forgot the third one. Oh, morning. You get, you get it's so interesting to, to have the baby swaddled because, you know, I remember nursing my own that I was so worried that they would fall asleep. And, you know, yeah, we do have a problem nursing, with sleeping babies. Yeah, during nursing, it's okay because they're getting a lot. We almost even prefer for the first three months of life still to, to breastfeed skin to skin. A lot of parents forget how important skin to skin is, not just for preterm babies or medically fragile babies, all babies benefit from skin to skin for up to three months of life. So we are okay with them being open and on you for a breastfeeding. It's for our bottles. Bottles are much more difficult for the babies than breastfeeding. Oh. breastfeeding. They get, think about that breast is on their face. They're getting a ton of support and stability during a breastfeeding. During a bottle feeding, they are not. Oh. So we recommend you're going to swaddle with their hands up by their face. If a baby is coming home with a nasal gastric tube and you're worried about them yanking it, swaddle them with their hands on their chest. That's fine. But we want them to have nice containment, alignment, and support. Support. With support. Them. There you go. Um, so yeah. So again, even if you're going to breastfeed a baby and then you're going to top them off with a bottle, throw them in a quick swaddle. Um, again, that extra support is going to make them much more coordinated and easier to eat from a bottle, which we know physiologically is more difficult for them. You're saying bottle feeding is more physiologically difficult? It's so yeah. interesting because I always thought of breast being difficult, no. more making, causing more work for the baby. So they're growing their muscles better. So this is this, this whole idea about, um, so why I'm a big proponent for slow flow nipples. So when a baby has to eat from a mommy breast, they have to use all of these muscles in their mouth in order to create the proper mm. suction and compression to empty a milk bed from mom. If they feed from a regular bottle, they don't have to elicit so much of that oral musculature. To, in fact, a lot of them become munchers. Like, have you ever like heard a mom saying, "Look, oh, baby's just like kind of moving their mouth. They're not really, really sucking." It's because they know that if they were to really, really suck on that bottle, they would drown. Too fast, so they man. compensate. They are so smart. These babies, they compensate by then purposely reducing their suction to just a compression-based suck to slow that flow. And while I'm very proud of these babies, they're very smart. <laughs> it actually stunts the development of the rest of their oral musculature. So this is why breastfed babies have far superior speech and feeding skills in toddlerhood than bottle fed babies, because breastfed babies are using all of those muscles to grow their mouths. So yes, it's initially more difficult, but it serves the role for growth and later development. So we recommend every baby full term, no medical issues, every baby to be on a slow flow nipple for the first three to four months of life. So they have an opportunity to grow those muscles to make that gap between breast and bottle a little bit smaller um, for their oral musculature. That slower flow also gives them more time to coordinate. Baby's greatest difficulty is, is not that they don't know how, they know how to suck, they know how to swallow. They've been practicing these things in the womb since 12 to 13 weeks gestational age. So they have fantastic neural pathways for that. It's coordinating breathing. That is the difficult thing for them. So the slower the flow, 
the easier it is for them to pause and breathe. That's why we see breastfeed, breastfed babies. They take longer because they suck a little bit. They eat a little bit. They pause they breathe, they relax, right? What happens when we're feeding a baby for the bottle? They pause and we're like, keep going, keep going. Mm -hmm. Like We're encouraging them. We're not encouraging that normal self-regulation as we would if they were breastfeeding. Does that make sense? No, it does. And I don't think it's automatic for people to get this low flow nipples and it takes how much longer? Say the average full-term baby to use a slow flow nipple versus a regular one. Oh no, they learn right away. Those not, not to those know ones. how, but does it take, it has to take longer because it's a slow flow nipple. No, no, no. the research shows that feeding efficiency, feeding duration and time to acquire full oral feeding skills, at least for preterm babies is faster than if they were to learn on a faster flow nipple. So um, it's really like, just a matter of alerting the parent early on, please buy the slow flow nipples. Well, if you like, I mean, I, I work at um, NYU Winthrop Hospital and on the maternity floor, if a parent does choose to bottle feed, they're only supplying slow flow nipples. So they, are they pointing it out to the parent? I mean, my experience why, with parents like, is why? like they're pushing the no. breast, breast, breast. Anyway, I don't hear anybody getting any bottle feeding information no. in the no. hospital by, 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 you know, the the way the hospital has to work by baby friendly. I know, I know. And there's no reason why we can't give parents this information from a hospital. No, for sure not. No, this is so, so, so important. Yeah. And especially for these moms that have to go back to work in, you know, four, six, eight weeks. Um, there's also a big misconception about not starting a bottle right away because you want them to breastfeed. But if you have to go back to work, you also have to make sure that your baby can feed without you there while you're back at work. So I like to support parents introducing a bottle early on, even if it's just one bottle every day or every other day, giving them that opportunity to learn so that you as a parent has peace of mind that when you go back to work, your nanny or mom or dad, whoever's with the, the baby while you're there can feed them. Right. And you already pointed out that the whole um, nipple confusion is a myth anyway. Yeah. So do you, do you like certain kinds of nipples like the nuck or the, the kind of nipples that are more Great question. So the nook is an um, orthodontic nipple mm. and it's wider. So here I'll draw it for you. It looks like this. So this mm. is an orthodontic nipple. Right. This People can't is, see who are listening to my audio, but. Oh, it's, think, uh, yeah. it's just, it's wider. It's like flatter and wider. This uh, promotes a compression only suck. So if you think about the baby's tongue, it looks like, um, it looks like a hot dog bun and you want the nipple to be the hot dog. So the straighter the nipple, the better for that lingual grooving, that hot dog bunning of the tongue. That is the skill that promotes both suction and compression. And that's what builds the oral musculature the best way for later speech and feeding development. And what about the pacifier? You know, I, I know that for me, I try to keep, if a, if a baby is learning to breastfeed, I try to keep them away from the pacifier as much as possible for the first two weeks until breastfeeding is established. Yeah, I'm absolutely okay with that unless the infant is under distress for any mm -hmm, reason. Right. So if you have a baby with reflux or a cow milk protein allergy or any other medical condition going on, um, we know that in the neonatal period, stress is not benign. Right. We know that uh, cumulative stress in the neonatal period can actually create later neurodevelopmental problems due to the way the brain is wired with that cortisol release in, in that early stage. So if a pacifier is what's going to bring peace to your baby, even if the goal is to breastfeed, we do not see currently a huge effect to that. Uh, there is not strong research showing a direct link that you are not going to be successful because you've given your baby a pacifier. Um, I'm kind of partial to just keeping babies happy. Right. So, no, no, a million percent. And that's a really good point. But I do see babies who are learning how to breastfeed and they haven't gotten it down yet. And every time they cry, they get a pacifier. So they kind of use up a lot of their sucking energy. Oh yeah. I mean, I think, I think everything in moderation and right. your goal right there, if you have a hungry baby and you're looking for them to breastfeed, you want them to soothe themselves on, on the breast. Um, and we also know the, that if, you don't want to use a pacifier. There's other ways to pacify your baby. Like that mom can pump to empty and put the baby on an empty breast and do non nutritive sucking on that breast. That's a fantastic way to support babies that are um, in distress and aren't feeling well or, or a little colicky. Um, 
very, very, very good because not only are they getting the benefit of a non nutritive suck, which is naturally calming to them, they're also now getting the benefit of the skin to skin, which is going to regulate their heart rate and their respiratory rate and significantly calm them down due to the release of happy hormones. Right. But I'm going to, I'm going to be devil's advocate here and take the opposite stance because I'm also very pro mom and I find parents are exhausted and the baby needs that non nutritive, you know, soothing, suckling, and they use their breast as that. And I'm like, no, give the baby a passive parent, go to get some sleep. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like I, I don't believe in do all one way or do, right. you've got to, you've got to flow with it. Um, right. And I struggle Literally. with this as a parent <laughs> myself because I'm a type A and like, I like this and I like that. Right. Kids don't think that way. The kids don't read the textbooks. Right. So I am very much about parental support um, and parental sanity. So if that is something that they say, there's no way I can keep my kid on me like that. Then I think a pacifier is not going to cause any harm to your early infant. We do right. recommend though pacifiers start getting weaned out between 12 and 14 months of age. So it doesn't affect later um, teeth and dentition. Right. right, right. We're still on the, on the immediate newborn period. We haven't been able to leave it yet. Yes. So back to that period, any tips on combining breast and bottle? Because, you know, I do have families that want to do both. Yeah. So it depends on, um, it's very individual for those families as well. And depends on the mom's availability to pump. I find like that is often the biggest question I have to ask before supporting a family with, um, with a strategy. For example, um, if a mom is going to be home and has the ability to pump whenever, then I'll say, why don't you alternate, right? So you empty once with baby and then you empty once with the pump and then you alternate, then you empty again with baby and you empty. There's some moms that rather start with the breastfeeding and then top off with the bottle. Um, it has a lot to do with the scheduling, unfortunately. Um, I have found families to do a wide range. I have some families that do um, all the, like, the sleepy times, like the early morning, the right before the naps and the right before bedtime breast and the rest of the time bottle or only when dad is home or only when grandma's around or whatever the case may be. And the babies end up doing very nicely. They are way more resilient and flexible and, and amenable than we give them credit for, I think. Right, right. And I have families also who, who do give breast milk, but exclusively through a bottle. Oh, that's a wonderful option. That's right. a wonderful option. There's not only the benefit of breastfeeding from the physiologic touch and the bonding that happens, but also the nutritional portion of the breast milk. Uh, we know both of those things are wonderful, but for those parents that can't or won't and, or pumping isn't in their cards, you know, the formulas have done a really great job trying to mimic the breast milk compositions in terms of, you know, DHA and protein and all of that. So um, I have a lot of families that also choose to breastfeed and then supplement with the mm -hmm. bottle if they don't want to pump at all. So there's a lot of variations. And I think you just have to figure out which one works best for that family's personal goals, that baby's ability, um, and, and, and obviously nutritional uh, uptake and caloric gain as well. So, right. Absolutely. So the next scenario I have is the baby who's spitting up a lot and is fussy. So I am going to say, of course, this is not medical here for medical advice. Please consult your physician. Um, and some of this can easily be say a milk protein intolerance that you mentioned, um, or other reasons for the baby to be uncomfortable, but some of it could be feeding technique. Absolutely. Here so we, <laughs> we know that bottle mechanics, um, baby positioning, all of this plays a huge role into um, why a baby might be refluxing or having more sped up episodes. So first, I mean, to understand a little bit about reflux, we know that when milk goes into the stomach, it causes what we call gastric distension. And then there's natural recoil. It's like a balloon, right? So the, the further it stretches, the more recoil it's going to want. And as it recoils, this is when these reflux episodes might occur. That, and also listen, think about a baby. Babies are mushy. They're low tone. They're, they're babies. They can't hold a muscle contraction tight forever and ever and ever. So there's going to be what we call this transient relaxation of that sphincter right on top of the stomach. This is normal. Every baby is going to reflux. So when we have parents who say, oh, my baby is vomiting, that's kind of normal, right? right. There's a normal amount of that. Uh, what I find is a more significant uh, sign is 
my baby's vomiting a lot and they're in a lot of distress. Right. When I hear about the baby being in distress about it, that is what signals me to say, okay, let's, let's, let's look further. Let's definitely get a, an appointment with your pediatrician or find a specialist. But if you want to be preventative in nature, there are definitely key things that we can do. Or if you're finding that your baby is already demonstrating some of these things first, the bottle, we know that if you have a bottle that is what's considered vacuum free, it is better than if it's a vacuum tight bottle. So I want you to think of, uh, let me see if I have a water bottle. So I want you to think of a water bottle, right? If I were to have water in here and drink it, you see how like my, this bottle would collapse as I right. pump water, it collapses. That is when it is vacuum tight. When it collapses, you have to release the seal in your mouth to let air be redistributed back into the bottle in order for you to get more. And there's this like opening seal of and closing the seal and opening the seal. You know, when babies have to do that, they end up swallowing more air and that's going to increase the amount of gastric distension that happens in their, in their stomach. So any strategy that reduces the amount of air they swallow is going to help. So getting a vacuum free bottle. So we have these vented bottles. You'll see them like Dr. Brown's is vented. Mm -hmm. uh, Advent has a vent one. Um, they're very, very popular now. So we know that definitely helps what those vents do. It helps distribute the air and liquid flow so that baby doesn't have to break their seal. And so it's a more consistent way to suck without having to accidentally swallow any air. If though you have a standard bottle with the cup and the nipple and you don't want to go and splurge, there are cost-effective ways to create a vacuum-free system. The trick is slightly, just slightly unscrew the cuff from the bottle. Um, so you may drip a little bit, try to find that sweet spot and that's gonna allow some air in and you're gonna see that your baby's not gonna have to break their seal. So there's a cost-effective way to do that if you don't wanna splurge on $12 a bottle. We also know that going back to flow rate, when the nipple flow rate is very, very fast, it reduces the amount of ability a baby has to swallow. I want you to think of, um, like if you're like trying to drink from a water bottle and someone's holding it up and you're go, 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 right? Like you're spending so much time trying to swallow that liquid that you don't have the time to pause to breathe. What we know is that babies naturally have that in coordination. So when the liquid is faster, it um, disrupts where they can take that breath. And we often see that sometimes they confuse it. And so when they want to take a breath, there's liquid in their throat area that could potentially go down their lungs. Or when they go to swallow, there could potentially be air in their throat area, which they then swallow into their digestive tract. So a slower flow nipple allows them to better coordinate. I'm gonna suck now, I'm gonna swallow now, I'm gonna breathe now. And it avoids any aspiration and swallowing of air. So these are all really great strategies. I am also a very big proponent for what's called the elevated sideline position. So we traditionally have always just fed babies in the nook of our arms with their nose and their belly button facing up at the ceiling. The elevated sideline position is when you're holding the baby on their side. So their nose and belly button are still in alignment, but they're facing out to the side to like a three o'clock or a nine o'clock um, on a clock if you're a right hand or a left hand. I'm a righty and it happens to work out really nicely because the way that the esophagus enters into the stomach is slightly to their right. So when you're holding them and their left side is down on, the, on your leg and their right side is up, it actually creates a greater space between where the liquid is in the stomach and where the esophagus enters into the um, stomach. So it actually reduces when a baby has transient relaxation, there's no pressure on that lower esophageal sphincter. So when you're feeding a baby this way, again, I like to be swaddled with the hands up by the face. You're feeding baby and you're feeding baby and you're watching them and you're looking for their cues and you're going to be being really intuitive. If a baby all of a sudden has a really concerned look on their face, as a feeder, I want you to say, maybe baby needs a break. Uh, if you're feeding baby and they're happy as can be, continue to feed them. I know a lot of times we say, oh, baby is vomiting a lot or has a lot of reflux, you know, burp them after every one ounce. And I find that sometimes is not the best recommendation because what if they don't need burp after every one ounce? We want to be what's called infant driven. We want to be very, very respectful of the baby's cues because they are communicating with us. We just have to learn their language. 
When a baby needs to burp, the biggest sign that they'll give you is either stretching their torso, like where they kind of arch or elongate, or turning their face to their right. That's called the ATNR. It's a reflex they have. When they do that, I keep them in this side lying position. I put the bottle down and all I do is switch my hand and burp. By doing this, what I do is I keep that concentrated air bubble at the top of their belly. So when I go to burp, it's right there pushing against the lower esophageal sphincter and it comes out. What I find is that when we're feeding babies in this upright position, and now we decide to burp, we bop them around, we get them up here, we bop, oh, that's not working, I'm gonna try this, oh, we try it again, we get it back up here. And what we're essentially doing is we're jostling off the milk and the air bubbles in the belly, so it's more difficult to get a really concise burp out of the baby. So this single-handed transfer uh, helps the mechanics of burping. And again, that air in the belly is contributing to that gastric distension. So the better we get that burp out, the less chance of a large vomit that might cause distress for your baby. Um, trying to think what other goodies I have. Burping when the baby is cueing, listening to the baby's um, cues. There's also something called the pacing technique. When I'm feeding a baby and they look like they're in distress, what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow them the opportunity to breathe because keeping in mind, they know how to suck. They know how to swallow. They've been practicing that, like I said, for a really long time in the womb. It's coordinating breathing, which is where they get upset and where they get confused. So pacing is literally the act of either pulling the nipple out of their mouth gently or tilting it down for a dry swallow so that they could prioritize breathing. This is kind of similar to the, the coordination that they would have at a breast where they have more control. They don't have as much control with the bottle. So I like this because it allows them to breathe. It reduces the chance of them getting incoordinated, but it also slows the rate of liquid that goes into their stomach. Um, babies aren't, weren't designed to get 60 cc's or two ounces in their belly in 10 minutes. That's very, very fast. That's going to cause very, very quick gastric distension and can exasperate reflux. So when you pace, you're literally slowing the flow rate of liquid into the stomach, allowing some gastric emptying to happen. So you're not getting a full gastric distension, again, exasperating reflux. Um, so there's a lot of goodies and these kind of things are very non-pharmacological in nature, things that you can train your families to do, um, things that you could always do with your babies from the get-go so that you could prevent those issues and being more preventative instead of problem-based. This is really such amazing tips. And I want to tell everybody listening to the audio that um, you had a baby and a bottle, not a real baby, <laughs> a doll and a bottle model. And so some of this is clear if you actually watch it. So this is also going to be posted on YouTube on the J-O-W-M-A, a Joma YouTube channel. So people can actually watch it. It's, it's clearer when you watch it. So that that is just so much amazing, amazing um, advice. I want to move on to, trans we're going to just grow this kid up to about, you know, at least four to six months and talk about transition to solids, because that's another, I find, stumbling block moment. Yeah. Um, so there's two trains of thoughts, right? We know that the AAP feels very strongly about not starting solids in babies um, until they're six months of age. And there's a lot of research to support that from a nutritional standpoint. Um, however, it misses the bar when it comes to a developmental standpoint. There is a lot of lessons these babies can learn early on that are almost crucial for the next stages of eating. I find starting at six months to be a little bit too late. And I look at it from a very developmental standpoint. Babies are given these fantastic, amazing oral reflexes for a reason. And we want to optimize on those oral reflexes to create ease and support for the babies while they're learning new tasks. So I am a big proponent for starting spoon feeding somewhere between four and five months of mm -hmm. age. It is very dependent on that infant's head and neck support. Mm -hmm. So if you have a seat and you put baby in and they're like wobbling their head like a top, right? that baby's not going to be ready for spoon feeding, right? So you give them a little bit more time, make sure you're really focusing on tummy time, a lot of good trunk and head support activities for them, putting them on a medicine ball, um, all of that. And then if by five months, 
that baby's head and neck support still isn't great, that's where I would say, okay, we'll get a, a seat with a higher back. <laughs> and then you solve that problem. But I, 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 wait, I want to interrupt you. I'm sorry. I want to go back a little bit about yeah. tummy time because I am a fanatic about tummy time. And I uh, want your opinion on how tummy time or lack thereof feeds, feeds, feeds into this. Oh, so it's so connected. It, when a baby doesn't get tummy time, it, pr pr it creates a cascade of delays that you wouldn't even, like, it'll affect handwriting at seven years old. There is so, <laughs> there is so much that comes out of that tummy time. If there's one thing besides nutrition and growth that you need to support for these families, it's tummy time as early as possible. And tummy time doesn't have to look the way it looked to us when we were learning about tummy. It doesn't have to just always be on the floor on a blanket. Right you know, putting baby chest to chest is right. tummy time. putting them on, um, on a pillow and reading them a book is tummy. like, there's so I, many. Right. I will say that I call that tummy time light. Cause I have a lot of parents thinking tummy time is just on their chest. And I do want them on a flat surface, especially as they get older to get more graded, yeah. you know, input. It's funny. Cause you know, obviously all my friends and cousins, they always ask me a, a thousand baby questions. Oh, what share should I get? Oh, what, what about this? What about that? And I'm a big believer the best place for your baby is on the floor. You right. get a bunch of different blankets and you alternate them so that you get used to different sensory rich environments on their hands, on their face. Um, and they should just be on the floor and that that is their comfortable place. And if you want to pop them up yeah, for a couple hours, you know, scattered throughout the day, equaling about an hour or two, but the rest of that time, they should really be, they should be on the floor. It's the safest place. You don't have to worry about them falling off of anything. Right. So. But you know what I find? And this is like, I talk about this a lot. So bear with me. For yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I find that the babies who need it the most are the ones that really won't do it. So I try to not be guilt inducing. I try, I, I give a goal of 10 minutes, four times a day. And then I say work towards it because a lot of the babies who are like this, just cry, they cry and they scream and you have to pick that baby up. We're not trying to torture oh, a baby. Oh no, no. I come 100% agree with you. That's exactly yeah. the right. And I do the same thing. You start small. You start small a couple times a day and then you, you grow on that 100%. Right. I'm also against containerizing babies, you know, because when they're not on their belly, they're usually in some kind of container. That's like these chairs. They went, oh, can I get this? Can I? And I'm like, why? Why have three different chairs? Just put them on, put them on a mat on the floor. Right. So, so what do you see for down the road for babies that don't get tummy time? You mentioned it briefly. Uh, well, as it relates to, to feeding. To feeding and to speech. Does it affect speech? Yeah, it can. So I can find research oral, for this. Everything is oral motor in nature, right? Mm -hmm. And we have to think that we think about speech and feeding as motor tasks, but they are really sensory motor tasks. So they need good sensory reception and processing in order to elicit the appropriate motor tasks for both speech and feeding. So when a baby has the opportunity to have good tummy time in the neonatal period, they are doing more than what we think. They're not just growing their trunk and their neck muscles, which are so important for speech and feeding, because if you can't breathe, you can't eat. If you can't breathe, you can't speak. And all of these respiratory muscles are in our trunk. So we need that baby to eventually get good abdominal muscles, good shoulder girdle muscles, good neck muscles so that they can breathe adequately. We also know that swallowing is all here in the neck muscles. So the better able, they're able to get that head up as they get closer to two, three, four months of age, that's going to help strengthen all of the muscles that they need for safe and efficient swallowing. Going on from there, we know that the more strong the base core is, helps the strength and the movement of the extremities that come out of it. So we think of extremities as arms and legs, which is true, but we also need to think about the tongue and the jaw as an extremity. So when we have a base that is weak, we're gonna have poor posture, we're gonna have weak muscles, and we're going to see more of a chance of an open mouth posture and low tone occurring there. When a baby has a low tone and has this open mouth posture for prolonged periods of times, the air that's coming into the mouth actually desensitize the sensory receptors throughout that oral mucosa and the pharynx. And that is going to lead to potential aversions or potential sensory integration dysfunctions, uh, set certain food sensitivities, and will certainly lead to articulation errors because their tongue 
needs to feel different points of contact while they're creating different sounds. Like when you make the L sound, you can very clearly feel the tip of your tongue on your palate. La, 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 right? You feel that there versus you say the K sound and you can very feel, clearly feel the back of the tongue against the palate, right? They'll desensitize their, their sensory receptors and they won't be able to feel that as much. We also know that when a baby's on tummy time, they're inevitably going to get tired and they're going to put their face against that material that they're laying on. And that is going to desensitize their oral musculature around their face, their facial system. We know the trigeminal nerve that then um, is responsible for sensation and motor is so intrinsically tied to feeding and speech development that those babies that don't get the right kind of sensory or we would call sensory deprivation around the face it directly affects their motor. So we need them to have a sensory rich experience. You also know that as that baby gets better with tummy time, they're gonna start reaching for items and bringing it to their mouth. A lot of parents will put like gloves or socks on the baby's hands or like, oh no, 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 don't put them in their mouth, that's dirty, right? We need them to put things in their mouth. There is a very normal developmental trajectory for self-gagging. The more a baby puts something in their mouth and gags, the more you laugh at them and be like, you're so silly, cut that out. The sooner their gag desensitizes and moves posterior backwards to a adult placement. It's for those babies that don't get that desensitization. Those are the ones that end up in childhood and childhood with very sensitive gag reflexes. And it's so interesting. And, and I always have to have the conversation at the four and three month visit that just because your child's putting their hands in that does not mean they're teething, right? It's always misinterpreted. They must be getting teeth. No, it's actually, um, it's for stability. So if you think around that time, uh, developmentally, a couple of key things happen. One, their buccal pads in their, their cheeks start diminishing. So now where they had this huge base of stability in their cheeks, they are now losing it. We also see that their larynx is descending. So where they had a lot of stability here in their throat between the big tongue in their mouth and um, that larynx being high up, they're face is growing faster than their tongue. So now their tongue is filling up less oral space and their larynx is lower down. Now they have all of this open space and what they're doing is they're seeking stability. So that's why they're putting things in their mouth. And this is one of the reasons why I like to start spoon feedings around four to five months of mm. age is because we want infants to be self-directed with it. So you give them a spoon to play with, they're instantly gonna pick it up with a palm or grasp, that is a reflex, right? You put it into their palm and they're automatically gonna close. And guess what they're gonna do next? They're gonna automatically put it to their mouth because now they have this need to fill this open physiologic space. And so what did you just do? Well, you just taught your kid how to spoon feed. Now all you have to do is dip that in liquid in, in puree and they're gonna do that. And now they're gonna get taste also. You essentially don't even have to spoon feed them. They're gonna be able to do it on their own because the reflexes set them up for success between that age. Four to six months is when all of those reflexes begin to diminish. So if you don't start until six months of age, you are now having to go against baby will. And baby wow. will be harder. You gotta tell this get, to the AAP. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I, I've, I've thought about it um, and my, my when I educate, I mostly dietitians, I educate a lot of dietitians about this because I'm a, a full supporter of a virgin gut and breastfeeding. And um, all of the research that the AAP came out on, it's all on babies with virgin guts that have never been exposed to formula or any uh, anything else other than breast milk. So their gut microbiome is very, very, very rich. So, so right. I'm going to stop you just a minute. Are we talking about, because we do, I do have an approach where if a baby is completely breastfed, I don't push solids before six months. But if the baby is formula fed, I encourage it as soon as they're ready at four months. Would you do that differently for the breastfed baby? I or would. Not? I, would. Mm -hmm. I would still put that baby in a chair. I would still give them a spoon. And all I would do is just give them breast milk and a bowl so that they can still learn how to move their mouth, how to bring a spoon to their mouth. Just the beautiful reciprocity of being eye to eye with a parent and, oh, you're tasting this. Oh, this is like, there's so much social skills that are learned during a spoon feeding, early spoon feeding. So I have them do everything I would with a formula fed baby, but without cereal or a puree. Amazing. And it could just be breast milk because 
from an oral motor standpoint, we are doing a disservice to these babies not introducing it while their reflexes are there to support them. Now you're talking about giving the baby a spoon because I think a lot of people think of spoon feeding as something the parent holds the spoon. No. No, babies are literally, they have a reflex to put things in their mouth. Like even if you, with it, it, again, I also like the spoon because it does gag the baby. And that also helps moms and dads learn early on that gagging is okay. There's nothing there that the baby will choke on because what often happens if a baby doesn't get a rich experience gagging with a spoon, when a parent then introduces the solids, you know, like when babies learn to walk, they fall. When babies learn to chew, they gag but then the parents think it's choking and then it creates a lot of parental anxiety. Right. And then we see a lot of kids pull away from foods at that time because the parents are anxious and the babies pick up on that. So if I can create a rich gagging experience with a spoon, so interesting. Yeah. we can actually uh, desensitize the baby and the parents to gagging for spoon feeding and uh, for salads. Right. What do you think about baby led weaning? I think that it is very intuitive and baby driven, and I'm all about listening to a baby's cues. Um, I do think, though, that parents need to be aware of the differences between gagging and choking and bite sizes. We do see a lot of um, research showing uh, foreign body aspirations with babies who accidentally take too much and choke. We have a lot of choking experiences, and we have a lot of parents that get traumatized and infants who get traumatized if it's not handled perfectly. So I think it's a great recommendation for very thick skinned parents or maybe like parents of like third children. Uh, but if you have a parent that's very anxious, just make sure that they have really good um, support and education on the difference of a gag versus a swallow uh, versus a choke. Um, look for the different signs. Like if they're not making any sounds and they're blue in the face, you go ahead and you do your Heimlich. But if they're just Wah, wah, you know, like and a red in the face, that's most likely a gag and you support them through it. Or you say you have to chew and or, or, I, I'll take that out. I'll help you. And you stay very calm. Um, so it's, it's a hard, it's a hard recommendation to give. Um, right. I mean, the concern that I have with the baby led weaning, I mean, first of all, to the, when it's taken as a fad and it's taken very extremely, that's different than just the concept of, I mean, part of baby led weaning would be to give the baby a spoon, which you're saying to do, which a parent who is just spoon feeding the baby themselves is not doing. And that's, they're taking something from the baby that the baby should get. Um, but the problem I have is I'm also, different babies will get to textures at different um, stages. I like to tell the story of my own granddaughter who had no teeth till 15 months, but chewed down hamburgers at six months, okay? So she was a texture champ and it's not even about the teeth. Um, a lot of people think it's about the teeth. Um, but a lot of babies do take a little longer to adjust the textures. And if you're doing baby led weaning, they may be getting too quick yeah, going through the textures. Especially with spices and stuff. Like, you know, like they say, like, you're, you know, if you're eating a chicken wing and baby's reaching for it, you're supposed to give them the chicken wing. Like, well, yeah, that's a, that's a huge jump from, um, right. from a, a developmental standpoint. Like if you think about why we do what we do with our stepwise, like one new food, um, every three days is not only for allergies, but it's also so that they can get used to it and, and grow with that. Uh, we also know that it takes kids 10 to 13 trials of a new food before they establish a true like or dislike for it. So, you know, for these parents that might try parent let, uh, infant led weaning, baby led weaning, you know, you give them something and the baby has like this gross, you know, response to it, they'll be less likely to try that again. Uh, without that education that no, 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 you can still try it, maybe try it in a different way, in a different shape, a different, you know, format, whatever the case might be. Um, there's a lot of um, trial and error that comes to it, but we do like a stepwise approach because it's preventative in nature. So that's why that baby led weaning sometimes is too big of a jump for some families and some babies, especially. Right. Now, what about the baby who's um, not taking solids well because I, I i'm actually for some reason seeing more of that lately i don't know if it has something to do with the pandemic that are just jumping right to chewables no the, these are babies who are refusing to eat solid foods they're just not transitioning they're refusing it they're turning away they're so sometimes they're not gaining weight well infants have a unique ability to self-regulate their caloric intake over a 24-hour period of time so um you have to make sure that the family is strategically reducing the amount of formula or breast milk that that baby is getting. Um, I'm also very, very big about mealtime schedules to make sure that the infant is learning 
um, okay, like this, this feeding will be a bottle, right? So, you know, they're getting that specific amount. This next feeding is going to be a spoon feeding. I don't like to do a spoon feeding followed by a bottle immediately. I like to make it its own uh, only because babies are smart. They say to themselves, well, I don't really like this and I don't really have to because I can just wait and take that bottle I want. So it's about understanding infant psychology and their sense of autonomy and how that develops and the stages in which it develops. Uh, my recommendation is a, about a month after, let's say you start a baby at spoon feeding at four months and it's taken a couple of weeks for them to get the hang of it. And that's okay. But once you feel like you've like gotten into a groove somewhere between five and six months, or if you started them at five and somewhere between like six and seven months is when I would introduce a straw cup and I would put formula or breast milk in that straw cup, not water. There's this huge problem where babies then compartmentalize and say, oh, my formula comes from the bottle or my breast milk comes from mommy and, and water comes from a straw cup. So when you try to get bottles away at 12, 13 months of age, they don't transition because this is too different. So right from the get-go, that straw cup is always going to accompany a spoon feeding and it's going to have the formula or the breast milk. They don't need any water. They're getting plenty of hydration through their liquids and their purees. Um, and so I really clearly differentiate those kind of meals and that increases their motivation. We want one meal roughly about every three to four hours. So when that baby gets to the next meal, they're hungry. They're going to be motivated to eat. And when they're there, they know that they only have about 30 minutes to eat. And whatever they don't eat goes in the garbage. And then they have to wait another two and a half, three and a half hours for that next meal. And the sooner they learn that, the sooner they come to the meal ready to take action because they don't listen to us. They don't really understand us all that well. They're listening to their gut. They're listening to their body. They are very good at listening to that. So if we teach them how to satisfy their hunger in the best way from a very early age, we see their motivation just grow and grow and grow. But if you have a baby who is only taking a couple of spoonfuls of spoon feeding and then knows that they can immediately drink, you know, six ounces of a formula or a breast milk. Now I'm not talking in the early ages. In the early, when you're introducing it, that's okay. But at, you know, six months, seven months, eight months, these babies are smart. They know, well, I don't have to do that. Why do I have to do that? It doesn't make me, doesn't satisfy me if I don't like that taste or that texture. So we have to be strategic with how we schedule schedule the baby's day. Right, let's just go back over that just a little bit because I think I missed it. <laughs> the, the bottle feeding is coordinated with initial spoon feedings. How timing wise? So I would, I would, so let's say if it's a every three hour schedule for this kiddo, I would mm -hmm. do like eight o'clock in the morning, a bottle when they wake up mm -hmm. and then three hours later, say at 11 o'clock, I would do a spoon feeding. Right. Right. That's what now, I said. Right. Because the they're not starving. I mean, if you get them up in the morning, you try to feed them and they're starving. They're just frustrated. Oh, they're so frustrated. Right. Yeah, I never do that. Yeah. That second feeding, I right. would do, I would introduce it not for volume, just for learning. Right. But they're so, not starving. They're not starving. They're wide awake. They're not overtired. It's the sweet spot. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So um, I think that's also really important for parents to realize it's not about how much they eat that first, mm -hmm. really the two months of spoon feeding has really nothing almost to do with how much they eat. It has to do with building good lessons about what spoon feedings are, what meals are, how to move your mouth, how to accept new tastes, what to do when you gag. Like there, are, It's more about learning than it is about volume. Once those lessons are learned and you start now growing into flavors and textures and different foods, that's when you can start flipping out calories of for formula or breast milk for calories of, of a puree. Um, but it's like a strategic kind of switch on because again, we want it to be about quality, just quality learning those very early spoon feedings. Right, right. The breast or bottle will be most of the nutrition and this will be for learning in the beginning. And then there, there is that switchover period. I do see babies at one who are taking 32 ounces or more of milk still. <laughs> yeah, so that's a problem. Well, no wonder they're not eating. Right, right, exactly. And I think that that goes back to structuring meals, which I know you said you're gonna talk about, but I don't think we, get into that as much as we could. Yeah. I mean, I, I, what I see is parents giving the baby the bottle whenever they cry. Yeah. There's a problem for that. Um, there's some really interesting research coming out of the West Coast about 
um, the snacking epidemic mm-hmm. where every time a toddler or infant is upset, we are very quick to put something in front of them, whether it's a bottle or a thing of Cheerios or whatever it might be. And what we're doing essentially is creating an emotional attachment to food, right? Mm-hmm. The only thing that calms me right now is this, is food. It's food related. Um, we need to make sure that we're giving our kids a lot of opportunities to learn other ways to self-soothe. Now, listen, I am all, listen, as a parent, like there's times where you're like, you're at a doctor's office and your kid is and like, you throw a little thing of Cheerios in front of them and they keeps them happy. Right. So there's always a time and a place. And, and we, I like to make sure that these recommendations, they're, none of them are black and white. They're all gray and you have to find what works best for you. But generally speaking, We want to make sure that the kids are not eating or drinking in between mealtimes. We want them to do all of that during a mealtime. And a lot of the reasons for it is, A, we want them to be motivated to come to the mealtime and learn and to do new things and to try new foods and to be tolerant of different tastes, smells, sizes, all of that stuff. We want to make sure that they're gaining sufficient weight. When we are giving them snacks throughout the day or letting them drink on water all throughout the day, we're keeping their digestive system in constant motion, which is burning calories that we may not be cognizant of. So we want to make sure that we're prioritizing their weight. We also want to make sure that we're prioritizing their um, digestive enzymes. Have you ever gone so long without eating that you get a little nauseous? Mm -hmm. Your digestive enzymes going haywire. We know that our system likes to be in a cycle and it likes to predict what's going to happen. So when you are consistently feeding a body every three to four hours, your body literally predicts that and it allows those digestive enzymes to appropriately produce to a good level. And those digestive enzymes are responsible for the absorption of calories, minerals, vitamins, all of these good things that you want your babies to get from their meal times. So ideally, If you're feeding every three to four hours, the baby is coming to the meal fully hungry and ready to eat and learn and do whatever they have to do to satisfy their hunger. Then there's a period of digestion. And then there's that period of digestive rest. And that is where those digestive enzymes get to reproduce. From there, it then triggers hunger. And then the baby comes back to the meal time and we'll eat like we want with these nice gaps. But like I said, when we're snacking in between meals or when we're offering water in between meals, we are not training the cycle. And those digestive enzymes do not reach appropriate levels for adequate absorption of all of those good things. So that's another reason. We also find that when you're allowing a baby to snack or drink in between meals, it's taking away from their opportunity to learn other things, right? Especially in our early, early days, Well, when are you going to squeeze in tummy time if you're feeding this baby every two hours Mm -hmm. and they're sleeping sometime in between? When are they going to learn to sing and to dance with you and read books and do all of these other really, really important tasks? Um, So we have to make sure that we are giving enough gaps between mealtimes and nap times to give them the opportunity to grow in other ways. And And it's also important for them to feel hunger. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, if you don't even have a minute of feeling it, you don't even know what it feels like. Yeah. And these toddlers are so smart. You know, you get these like eight month olds or even like two year olds and they say to themselves, they come to a mealtime and mom puts out something that they don't want. You're not that hungry. Well, I'm not that hungry. I've been snacking on those Cheerios there. And so I I don't need to do this. And maybe I'll just take a couple of bites just to keep mom happy because I know I could fill up on that eight ounce thing of water or those snacks are they going to come in another hour like they're smart they know how to self-regulate their caloric intake so it reduces their motivation to do all of these really important tasks during a meal time so that that set meal time it could not be is so 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 important for for all of their developmental needs their their nutrition their growth their um, developmental milestones there. It's just, it's goodness all the way through. Right. I'm going to, I always say this, I've done a lot of talks about um, feeding children. I interviewed a amazing um, pediatric dietitian named Yafi Lavova. You can look her up online. She is phenomenal. Um, and we talked about the division responsibility of feeding Ellen Satter, who's the grandma of pediatric nutrition, who said it is not your job to get your child to eat X amount. It's your job to say the when you're eating, the structure, the where you're eating and the what, but not 
whether you're going to child's going to eat it or how much. And it can't be said enough because I do have a lot of parents that get very frustrated that their you know, child who's starting to eat, their toddler is not in their mind eating at all. I feel like toddlers can live on air. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I always tell them they usually have one good meal, one bad meal, one no meal by two. Um, and that's where I think a lot of problems start when the parent is insistent that the child eats yeah. and then they don't. Yeah, so it's not only important to recognize the once every three to four hour meals, but the time limit to meals. And you let mm-hmm. them know you have 30 minutes to eat. And like, you get like, you know, I did this even with my son. My son is seven now, but like there was a time where I would put, I don't like this. And I would say, okay, no worries. You don't have to eat it if you don't want to. You know, breakfast is going to be in, you know, 13 hours. So we could just eat then, no big deal. And he's like, sure enough, don't eat, right? They, They listen to their stomach way better than they listen to us. So as long as you as a caregiver are creating a stress-free meal environment, providing them with that food, treating them with respect and allowing them to have autonomy, they will figure it out, right? But we do often see problems start to, to grow and manifest when parents um, are worried about it and rightfully so, right? When, when your baby's not eating and you're worried about waking, you're worried about them, you feel a little bit like a failure yourself, which is so not true in parents. Oh, it's so emotional, yeah. Themselves. But like, you know, you feel like you have to like chase your kid around and like get food in their mouths and, and we're then creating a whole subset of behaviors that right. we then have to, to, to work with. Um, so approaching the mealtime exactly like Dr. Satter has said, you put the food out, you create a safe, calm environment, you know, as humans, anytime we feel any negative emotion, you know, stress, lack of control, upset, any negative emotion, our body naturally produces adrenaline and adrenaline is an appetite suppressant. Mm. So it is part of our parental role to make sure that the meal times are as chill as possible. If you have a kid with sensory issues, you get them to calm down by jumping on a bed first to come to the mealtime more relaxed or give your kid a massage first and then sit them down and play nice music or make it a happy place and let them have the control that they're looking for. Again, they will listen to their stomach if they feel like they're in a safe environment and you are providing them with everything they need to make those right decisions. Right, and I love the idea of always give your child a spoon from the earliest age, even if you're not even up to actually giving them solids, um, because it gives them a sense of control, it gives them that ability to explore, and it's taking away that, well, I'm gonna feed you. Yeah, we are supporting them in their feeding. Right. It's like a gentle dance, but they are the lead. Right, what do you think about those pouches? (laughs) Just curious. So some of them really gross me out because you can't clean them, so they actually make a silicone pouch. Um, I think that as long as you understand the goal, there, I think they're a great. I think they're a great thing for a kid who wants to learn about a food that wouldn't be yet safe to put in their mouth. So um, the silicone, I prefer the silicone ones because you could wash them better. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a great way to um, introduce a new taste or a new texture to a baby. Uh, it keeps them occupied for a decent amount of time, depending on what you put in there. Um, and so I think it's great, but there's this misconception that it's going to be helping them chew. It does not help a baby chew. Mm -hmm. Um, that pouch is so big in their mouth. It really promotes more suction and sucking Mm -hmm. and munching and actual chewing. So just make sure that you understand why you're giving it to them. You're giving it to them for taste experiment, taste tolerance and texture tolerance. Um, so what I used in, in, when I was cooking, For my kid, when he was younger, I would like put that in front of him first while I was getting the rest of the meal. Like if he was like really like like hungry and in the mood to eat and I would let that like go. And then I would get the rest of the food and feed him right after that. Um, Because they're not really getting food from it as much as they're just getting the juice and the taste of everything. Right, and I think what I thought you were gonna say more of is that they're just sucking. They're not doing a lot of other feeding skills. And I think some parents do use it as the solid foods. No, 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 does not teach chewing at all it is not a stepping stone between spoon and and chewing it is literally just taste so yeah you're exactly right absolutely so i think we're gonna have to um stop here even though i really had so much else you're right i had so much else i wanted to cover i hope you do part two with me because i really want to talk more about um children who are, are challenging have real challenging feeding problems you know children may have developmental disabilities children who are preemies 
And that really is not fair to do that in, in five minutes. Um, so I want to thank you so much for doing this with me. Oh my gosh, this was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, please come back for part two. <laughs> I have, I, you let me know when I show up. I will. Thank you so much. You're welcome very much. Thank you. You too.